Dr. N. Sri Kumar is an assistant professor of philosophy in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He is a gold medalist for MA Philosophy from the Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam. He did his MPhil and PhD in Philosophy from the Central University of Hyderabad and specializes in the areas of philosophy of language, continental philosophy and hermeneutics. He has been into the academic profession since 1995 and is taught in Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi, Kerala and Bitspilani, Rajasthan before joining the IIT Midras in 2003. Dr. Sri Kumar has published articles in various journals and has presented papers in national and international seminars. Some of the courses he offers include European Philosophy, Contemporary German Philosophy, Introduction to Indian Philosophy, Philosophical Hermeneutics, Philosophy and Critical Theory and Philosophy of Language. Welcome to the UGC lecture series in philosophy on phenomenology and existentialism part 23. This episode will focus on the following topics. Husserl on relativism and solipsism, something which we have already examined in the last episode. How Husserl's phenomenology which emphasizes on subjectivity or transcendental subjectivity leads to a kind of relativism and solipsism and the answers Husserl provide to or a solution which Husserl provide to this problem. Intersubjectivity and subjective grounding. So, it is this notion of intersubjectivity which is proposed as a solution to the problem of relativism and but at the same time he emphasizes on subjective grounding which we will see what it later. Basic introduction to Heidegger and his philosophy because this episode we will try to wind up our discussions on Husserl's phenomenology and we will see a very basic introduction to Heidegger's phenomenology and phenomenological hermeneutics. Heidegger and phenomenology, basically we are trying to see Heidegger as a phenomenologist and not focusing much on his contributions in other areas of philosophy. Husserl and Heidegger, their peculiar relationship. So, these are broadly the topics which we are going to address in this present episode. So, the problem of relativism, we can say that even the most we have already examined this problem, how Husserl's phenomenology leads to a kind of potential relativism which we have already examined and we have already seen how Husserl is trying to address these criticisms or these challenges. And he says that even the most foreign has a core of communality or commonality, there is something which common, what is it? So, the other is not completely alien, the other person is not completely alien. So, we can see that this issue, the issue of the other or the other minds or other subjects, this is a perennial philosophical problem and now we see how Husserl is encountering it and how he addresses it and how he solves it. But what Husserl says is that there is a type I, he emphasizes on this concept, the type I, the world of the other is not an entirely different world from my own world. So, here we could see that Husserl is trying to point out or he is suggesting that there is a kind of analogizing experience, analogy, he takes the help of a concept of the concept of analogy to explain the problem of the other or the experience of the other. And in the world of the other or in his world also things, persons, environment, foreign world etcetera exist. So, he also the other person also shares a similar word like me and he too has a type home, the type foreign world which I have. So, there are a lot of commonalities which he is trying to emphasize on and again the gap between the far and the near is closed by analogizing a perception of the far as if it were near or as if if I were there I could have seen this. So, this possibility of placing me at least imaginatively on somebody else's place. So, this is a kind of analogizing experience if I were in his place I would have seen it in this particular way. So, 
it is this factor this possibility that makes the other not completely alien to me. See here we have a picture where a person imagines the status of the world, he thinks about the status of the world, it is my creation I am the only thing that exists. So, this is a kind of extreme solipsism which says that everything in this world there is only I who exist and everything I experience, everything I perceive, everything is my own creation or the creation of my own mind. So, what actually exists as reality is me, I am the only one who exists. Now, here this person exclaims about the status of the world and he says that it is my creation because I am the only one who exists and he now announces that everything is a creation of my mind. So, this is an extreme form of solipsism which any philosopher would like to or many philosophers would like to repudiate. And Husserl says that this problem if everything is constituted by the ego then everything that exists is merely a moment of the ego. So, applying this solipsism or trying to see solipsism in uh, Husserl's philosophy we can conclude or we can see it and perceive it in this manner. If everything is constituted by the ego then everything that exists is merely a moment of the ego. And then again the ultimate ground of everything is my subjective ego. So, I am the grounding force or I am the center of the universe. So, if you follow Husserl it is possible that we might come to a conclusion which is very similar to this. And again nothing is independent of my ego because as Husserl says everything is subjectively grounded, the ego grounds everything Husserl says. So, we could see that our ego is at the center and nothing is independent of my ego because everything is constituted by the ego and the world is given to the ego. So, in that case the ego is at the center and everything else is dependent on that. So, this is a kind of solipsism or this leads to a kind of solipsism uh, people might argue and Husserl's reply to this criticism which is attributed on his thought is that this solipsism Husserl says fails to account for the multiplicity of forms in which objects are constituted in consciousness and again he says that these critics are misled by the picture of a world which neatly divides into the subjective and objective domains which lie outside of each other. So, actually this is not the case the world is not divided into a subjective and objective domains which lie outside of each other. This is an image which is given or which is handed down by the epistemological tradition of the 16th and 17th century Europe where there is as Descartes constitutes or Descartes conceive a mind and a body which are independent of each other or in the language of Richard Rorty the outer and the inner space where the inner space reaches the outer space or the outer space is known by the inner space. So, that is not the case the world means Husserl says the world means world for consciousness. So, it is not confining to a subjective solipsistic world view, but rather he says that the moment we talk about the world we mean a world for consciousness. So, this dualistic picture handed down to us by the epistemological tradition is bypassed in this manner. Again he now introduces the concept of inner subjectivity and the concept of subjective grounding is explained with or it is rather harmonized with the notion of inner subjectivity by Husserl. He says that they are not contradictions, they are not contradictories inner subjectivity and subjective grounding because the notion of inner subjectivity refers or it suggests that things are not subjective or relative, but rather inner subjective there are many subjects and there is a possibility of communication and knowledge and understanding. And, but on the other hand the notion of subjective grounding seems to be suggesting that things are grounded in the subjectivity, which means the subject is a closed entity nothing goes out of it or there is which uh, closes or which rather repudiates or rejects any possibility for communication and understanding. But Husserl says that actually these two things are not contradictories by nature 
our experiences are intersubjective Husserl says, but they are grounded in the subjective consciousness at the same time they are grounded in the subjective consciousness and again they are for me. My experiences are for me and again our intersubjective existence in the world is a fact, we live in a world with others is a fact. So, Husserl raises lot of arguments against the criticism of solipsism or against relativism and subjectivism and he says that our communalization is a fact, we belong to a community, there are communities of egos and again we live with others, use a common language, others teach me how to use it and acculture me to the world and society. It is a fact that we all use a common language and others suggest a great deal of things to me, they acculture me to the world and the society. But this does not mean that things are not subjectively grounded. Husserl says that this is possible, this acculturization or using of common language, all these are possible because I as ego can make sense of these directions, suggestions and pointings given to me by others. So, I have to make sense of these directions. So, the ego is again re-emphasized here. So, ultimately we come back to the ego. So, here we can wind up our formal discussion on Husserl and Husserl's phenomenology. So, this is the 23rd episode we are discussing phenomenology and we have dealt with Husserl a great deal. We will be discussing some of these issues or we will be revisiting some of the problems which Husserl conceived as important in his phenomenology later while we discuss the phenomenologies of Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Jean-Paul Sartre and many other philosophers. And even when we discuss existentialism, we could see that the influence of Husserl is tremendous. So, we are not winding up our discussions on Husserl completely, but formally coming to an end of dealing with Husserl's major themes. Let us now see a very brief summary of Husserl's major themes which we have discussed various stages of Husserl's thought. We could see that there was a pre-phenomenological stage, then even in the phenomenological stage itself, there is the psychological stage, the eidetic phenomenological stage and the transcendental phenomenological stage. He another important theme in his philosophy is the natural world thesis, then the concept of essence and the notion of what that which is immediately given. So, then again the notion of consciousness. Consciousness I would like to emphasize here is one of the central concepts in Husserl's phenomenology. Then the intentionality of consciousness that is something which we have discussed in detail in some of our previous episodes because he says that consciousness is basically intentional. Then the phenomenological reductions, the various stages of reductions which I have briefly mentioned now. So, this is another concept or another series of things which are important in then the concept of transcendental ego. Ultimately it concludes Husserl's phenomenology in a sense concludes in the concept of transcendental ego because it is a final product of or the final residue of phenomenological reduction the transcendental ego which is a very peculiar unique concept and I have examined this concept in detail in one of my previous episodes. Now, we will discuss or we will come to the discussion of Heidegger, another very important philosopher Martin Heidegger. This is Heidegger who was born in 1889 and died in 1976 and he was born on 26th of 1889 to Friedrich and Johanna Heidegger, his parents and Heidegger was interested in his earlier period he was interested in Franz Brentano as in the case of Husserl. Husserl was also interested in the works of Franz Brentano who was a psychologist and uh, Husserl was his uh, in fact Brentano's student, but Heidegger was init initially interested in him. Then later he was exposed to Husserl's writings and turned attention from theology to mathematics and philosophy. Initially he was interested in theology and there was times when he was trying to get registered or be a part of the church, but later on 
he became more, in, more and more interested in mathematics and philosophy. And it was this interest in philosophy which ultimately took him to the thoughts of Husserl, from where he developed his own independent philosophy, which later took a turn, a hermeneutic turn. We will be examining all these things in subsequent episodes as well. Now, in 1919, we could see Heidegger becoming Husserl's assistant and almost 10 years he devotedly, he dedicated almost 10 years he dedicated for learning Husserl, Husserl's philosophy and phenomenology. And Husserl also considered Heidegger as his legitimate hire. Then he make uh, there when uh, during his association with uh, Husserl, at that time he met Karl Jaspers with whom he had a correspondence relationship for many years and many other important contacts. By 1924, Heidegger became an associate at the University of Marburg, where he wrote his phenomenal work, his masterpiece, Being and Time. And this is the photograph of uh, the famous French philosopher and writer, Jean Paul Sartre. And uh, because Heidegger influenced many thinkers, include Herbert Marcuse and Jean Paul Sartre at this particular time. Sartre, in fact, developed his existential philosophy independently and uh, there in Sartre's own philosophy he was tremendously influenced by Husserl and Heidegger, particularly by Heidegger. So, we could see that Sartre's philosophy, existentialism, he derives a lot of concepts and themes which was originally developed by Heidegger in his being and time. So, we will be examining all these things in subsequent lectures, but before that before we conclude on the basic introduction to Heidegger, we will have to see his ideology, his political ideology. To understand a philosopher, it is always essential to understand his political ideology, and what he believed in. This is one of the darkest chapters of Heidegger's personal as well as intellectual life. I was talking about the political ideology of Heidegger, because it is very important to know a philosopher, particularly in the modern times, to know her philosopher and his thoughts. It is important to know his political ideology. So, here we could see that he was associated with Hitler's National Socialist Party. This is one of the darkest chapters in Heidegger's life, intellectual as well as personal. He lost many of his friends because of his association with Nazism, including Husserl, because the relationship between Husserl and Heidegger was so, they were very close friends as well as associates. But this Heidegger's relationship with Nazis probably was one of the strongest reasons for their departing. In 1933, Heidegger became the rector of the University of Freiburg, and some of his uh, interpreters says that or some of his biographers say that even for this rectorship, the Nazis, his association with Nazism has helped. He joined the National Socialist Party and resigned from the university because of some, some conflicts that existed between the Nazis and other university faculty. Let us see uh, a video clipping and here this is from uh, the movie, the documentary Adolf Hitler directed by C. L. Dhir. Here, this is uh, what has happened immediately after Hitler gained power. Within a few months after he comes to power, Hitler declares all other political parties to be illegal. The fragmented army units are integrated in the SA. All government officials have to become a member of the Nazi party. All unions are dismembered and workers fronts established. The new propaganda minister Goebbels restricts the freedom of expression. Writer Hanani had once written that where books are burnt, people are also offered to the fire. Now the books of this very author are burnt and the Laura Lai becomes the name of an unknown writer. World famous books of German authors, poets and philosophers are banned. Das 
We have seen a clipping. There are three things to be emphasized. Number one, everything was integrated to Nazis, the National Socialist Party. Everybody, every government official has to be a member of this party. It was a completely totalitarian rule. Number two, there was no room for freedom of expression. All democratic rights were annihilated. And even we could see in the last part of the clipping that many books were burnt, including the books written by very famous, world famous German philosophers. And it is surprising how a philosopher like Heidegger, a first rate thinker like Heidegger supported Nazism. Until 1945, we could see that Heidegger continued his involvement with the National Socialist Party, but later on of course, he has uh, resigned from the party and uh, he broke with the Nazis, National Socialist Party in 1945, but never publicly apologized for his involvement with National Socialism. Recently, we have seen a great German writer or the Gunnar Grass was apologizing or rather revealing that he was part of the National Socialist Party and the kind of responses this revelation had all over the world. People have criticized him for hiding this fact for such a long time. But Heidegger never, he opened it, I mean he, he was, uh, he admitted it in his various interviews that he was part of the party and he never publicly apologized. To understand the depth of the situation, the kind of mass support National Socialist Party and Hitler had during that, during the 1930s and 40s. Let us see one more clipping, a very short clipping. This is supposed to be Hitler's first speech after acquiring power. So, you could see the kind of mass support Hitler had, the kind of support he had from his people. And Hitler's examples tells us how even a frustrate mind like him was not able to withstand the pressure and temptation of supporting the power, the center of power. And, but we could see that after writing Being and Time, let us come back to his philosophical life and philosophical works. After writing Being and Time in 1927, Heidegger later had a turn in his thought. This is something which is very important as far as Heidegger's intellectual development is concerned, this turn, which ultimately took him away from Husserlian brand of phenomenology. Heidegger's later work influenced the developments in hermeneutics and post-structuralism. We could see that many developments later occurred in these areas of philosophy, hermeneutics, deconstruction and all that was uh, influenced tremendously by Heidegger's this later work. Gadamer, Derrida and Foucault are some prominent thinkers who were influenced by Heidegger and Heidegger died in Freiburg on May 26, 1976. So, this is the end. Uh, so, we will find up our discussion on Heidegger's life here and now we will focus more on his philosophical works. Heidegger the philosopher.
It is very difficult to understand his thought mainly because of his the peculiarity of the language in which he writes and some of his critics and some of his interpreters even comment that Heidegger's, Heidegger writes in such a difficult German which has to be translated into ordinary German first then translated into English. If at all you want to translate you have to translate Heidegger because he writes in a very peculiar language very difficult language. He coins his own terms to and uses them freely without giving any background information in what sense this particular term is being used. So, it is very difficult to understand one of the main reasons is his language second thing is he is distinct and unique no doubt he was a totally unique thinker and again the kind of originality he commanded because he was though he belonged to the phenomenological tradition his thought his uh, particularly his later philosophy is absolutely unique and one of the most important thinkers of 20th century philosophy no doubt he is one of the most important thinkers even thinkers from other tradition the analytical philosophy of Anglo-Saxon world recognize this Heidegger's importance and greatness. So, our interest is to know or to understand Heidegger's relationship with phenomenology or Heidegger as a phenomenologist, how far Heidegger contributed to the development of phenomenological thought and how far phenomenology particularly the Husserlian phenomenology has influenced Heidegger. He was influenced by phenomenology no doubt and influenced the entire phenomenological movement in very important manner, there is no doubt in that. Even in his later period he portrayed himself as a phenomenologist, though Spiegelberg says that there is hardly any reference about phenomenology in his later work. There are occasions where he has claimed that he is a phenomenologist and uh, to understand this peculiar let us see how Husserl and Heidegger are related to each other and many consider Heidegger as Husserl's legitimate heir. But there is at the same time evidence that Husserl has repudiated Heidegger. So, it is a very complex relationship, but this relationship between Heidegger and Husserl is very important to understand Heidegger's philosophy. We will deal with all these issues in the coming episodes. Now, let us wind up this episode, let us summarize what we have discussed in this episode. Husserl's overcoming of the problem of relativism and his concept of intersubjectivity as subjective grounding. We have briefly seen this. Then we have seen an overview of Husserl's life and thought, then Heidegger's place in the phenomenological movement. Now, students can take up the following questions. How does Husserl ground intersubjectivity in subjectivity? And number two, what is the relevance of the notion of analogizing experience in Husserl's thought? Because the second concept analogizing experience is important to understand Husserl's concept of intersubjectivity. With this we will wind up this episode, thank you.